the reality is somewhere between the subjective and the objective, right? A lot of arguments that you'll have with people throughout your life are about exactly that Am I, are you irritating or am I oversensitive? It's like, well, you know, we're going to hash that out for a good long time before we figure it out But the point is, is that if you're possessed by an emotional state or a motivational state or an idea or some kind of complex You'll see the world through its eyes And then the facts reveal themselves to you through the lens of that particular set of ideas So it's a very frightening idea because, you know, we like to think of ourselves as masters of our own house Which is completely clueless because it's obvious if you watch yourself for like a month That you hardly ever do what you tell yourself to do And you're liable to do all sorts of other things that you don't even want to do You know, because you say, well, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week And I'm not going to drink you know, and maybe there's this person I'm not going to associate with And then, you know, you don't go to the gym And you find that person and you go out and drink with them And you think, what the hell's going on, you know and, But it's, it's, it's you, you're not the sort of person that will do what you say And so, like, what sort of person are you? Well, that's a psychoanalytic question It's a deep one Because you're a peculiar thing And there's parts of you that are really, really, really old and you know, the, the sort of naive you, the naive young you that you think of yourself as is like a little piece of flotsam in an ocean of complexity And the ocean of complexity is you And part of diving down into the depths is to start to understand what it means to be human And like, whatever that means, it's the one thing you can say about it for sure is that it's bloody peculiar So, here's some associations of ideas that go along with these symbolic representations that I was describing So, the feminine is often nature And here's some associations They're not necessary associations They're common associations So, if you see these sorts of things, they would make a narrative sense So, for example, if you see an old um, and somewhat evil woman in an animated movie And she lives in a swamp, that makes sense Now, why does it make sense? I can't explain that at the moment, but, well, it's partly because the swamp is outside of the standard bo borders of civilization And it's also a place of death, decay, and rebirth, so that's part of it Anyways, some associations, nature the, is the unconscious Why is the unconscious nature? Well, because you can't control it, it just manifests itself within you That's the Freudian id It's like dreams They happen You don't know what they mean, they just happen and so that's nature operating inside of you The terrors of the darkness Why? Well, remember when you were a little kid, you're three And you're afraid of the dark, because kids at three are afraid of the dark What's in the dark? What are you looking for in your closet? Monsters, right Where are the monsters? Well, they're not in your closet, hopefully So, but that's not to say that there couldn't be a monster in your closet and it's also not to say that when you look at your closet when you're a little kid that you're looking at your closet Maybe you're looking at the darkness And then the question of whether or not there are monsters in the darkness gets a lot more complicated I had a client once who was agoraphobic And she didn't like to take elevators, which is quite a common phenomena for people who are agoraphobic And so I was doing standard exposure, which is voluntary exposure to the unknown Which is a prime curative process in psychotherapy It's like Find out what you're afraid of that's interfering with your movement forward Break it into small pieces and expose yourself to it, that works So, we go to the elevator and, you know, I say, well, how close can you get to the elevator without being nervous? So she stands like ten feet away, I say, okay, well, stand there till you're bored and then go three steps forward So she could do that and, you know, made her a little nervous and then I said, well, stand there till you're bored And make sure you're looking at the elevator and not avoiding it and then take another three steps forward and, Okay, we keep doing that until she's like at the elevator So then, I say, well, here's the deal um, We're just going to let the elevator doors open You don't have to get on, we'll let them close And then that's it for, for today You know, and I always tell people when I'm doing that sort of thing that I'm not going to trick them You know, there's no tricks, it's like you don't have to do anything you don't want to do And I'm not going to play any games on you So, okay, so the doors open and she goes, that's a tomb and then it closes, and you think Well, was that an elevator or a tomb? And you might think, well, obviously it's an elevator It's like, things are not so obvious You know, because there are many ways of perceiving something And 
a given entity can be a member of multiple categories at the same time and you say, okay, well, yeah, the elevator's not a tomb but it's an enclosed, dark place that contains the unknown and when you see an elevator, you just see like a conveyance that moves you up and down but that isn't what she saw and you might say, well, what she saw is wrong it's like, not exactly, but it's not functional right, it's not, if you want to take an elevator then perceiving it as your tomb is probably inappropriate but the point is, is that it has a lot of associations, like, it, it's, it's a place of constriction and privation and isolation and separation and so it has elements of, there are elements of its being that overlap with other things that are frightening and so agoraphobics are often afraid too of being in a subway, being all crowded in the subway it's partly because they can't get out and make it to a hospital so enclosed places or crowd places are places where they encounter their mortality because they get afraid they're going to die and then they can't get to the hospital so, you know, they come into a room like this and sit in the middle and they, you, you think, hey, crowd of students they think, ah, place of death and it's like, well, you might say, well, no, this is a crowd of students and I might say, well, what are, how come you're so damn sure it's not a place of death like, generally it isn't, but any of you could drop dead of a heart attack in the next five minutes so why aren't you terrified out of your skulls because of that? and the answer to that is, you don't know that's the answer because as far as I've been able to tell most of the things agoraphobics are afraid of like that they might die at any moment actually happens to be true and so the fact that they're afraid of that, it's like, yeah? no kidding, you're afraid of that how are other people not afraid of it? well, that, that's a good question so, that's nature that's nature. I can tell you another reason, I think, why the feminine is nature. I don't know what you guys think about this, but I was pretty happy when I thought this up, and it took me a long time. So, so if you think about the world in Darwinian terms, right, it's a struggle for survival and reproduction, which are basically the same thing. Survival is you, but Reproduction is the survival of your genes. So it's a, it's a survival issue over very long spans of time. Okay. What do we call the selection mechanism? Natural selection. Na right, natural selection, right? It's nature who does the selection. Okay, so let me tell you something that makes female humans different than female chimps. I mean, there's lots of things that, that do. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but here, here's an important one. If you look at which male in a female in a chimp troop fathers most of the offspring, it's the dominant male. But the reason for that isn't because the female chimps sort of flock around the dominant male. Now that happens in other species, but it doesn't happen with chimps. What happens is the dominant male chases all the subordinate males away and will interfere with any sexual behavior they manifest. It'll chase them away. The females, though, are perfectly happy to mate with a subordinate male if they're in heat and they get the opportunity. So they go into heat, which is something that doesn't happen with female humans and they really don't care who they mate with 